groundreport.com is a citizen news reporting site that allows anyone to publish their own articles, videos, and photos to a global audience and earn a revenue share based on their traffic. All of our work is vetted by our volunteer editors and you can reach an audience of millions. Some of our big scoops have been the Beijing Olympics, the Mumbai terrorist attacks, Taliban activity in Pakistan, and then even in our backyard covering Obama's elections through, through the eyes um, and words of, of regular Americans. We have 5,000 contributors on the ground who regularly submit stories every day. Building Ground Report Space has been completely deliberate. Um, it's not a typical internet startup where you just want to get as many people as possible. We're looking for a very sophisticated digital reporter who is able to convey what's going on from the ground level. So we want two things. We want them to be savvy enough to use the, the digital reporting tools, but we also want them to be on the ground, hyperlocal, to report exactly on what they're witnessing in their immediate vicinity. They don't, we don't want someone who's sitting at a desk in New York writing about Pakistan. We want a Pakistani lawyer who was protesting the day before to be writing about Pakistan. So I've been very deliberate in doing outreach to journalistic bloggers, um, professional journalists, retired or, or students in training, um, and then also nonprofits. A lot of people who happen to be witnessing some of the world's most urgent issues and they're there on the ground but lack the proper platform to get the word out. The vetting process really happens at the report level, so anyone can sign up and report immediately and submit reports, articles, videos, etc. for publication. But it won't go live until one of our editors takes a look at it. So anyone is allowed to do that. That way we don't miss the big scoops. We open up the doors in that way, but we need that layer of approval for it to really make sure that it's up to our standards and to be able to stand behind our brand name. We're happy to serve both of those audiences. I mean, one of the biggest things about hyperlocal news that is covering, covering issues and events at a level that's even more granular than the city level is that most of those topics are really most interesting to the other people who are living in that area. So of course, a lot of Ground Reports coverage that's that specific will be interest to, interesting to people in, in those spaces. Um, but on the other end, we have people, um, for instance, American audiences and just audiences all over the world who want to know what's really happening in the world, who recognize that the international media is not serving its goal to really inform the public. And so they're interested in these stories too. And they rely on Ground Report to sort of aggregate and vet all of this information that's coming in and give you a real picture of, okay, here's what people on the ground experiencing this event feel about it. Here's what the real story is. The only thing that we mean with the original content policy is it means you must have the rights to distribute whatever content you post on Ground Report. So we're very happy to work with people who are reposting from their blog or from independent news sources. In, in fact, they're some of our most valuable partners. What we don't allow is copyright infringement or plagiarism, which actually is pretty rampant on a lot of um, citizen journalism platforms. And that's because our biggest value at Ground Report, and we've made our name on this, is by having sophisticated original content and original reporting. Um, and that also helps us to pursue a syndication model. You can't syndicate other people's content. It's also something that doesn't really serve us in the end. Um, and it's not the kind of contributors we're looking for. So we're happy to adhere to that policy. I would actually um, say the, op the opposite, that I think in recent years we've seen an explosion in um, the democratization of the media in terms of people having these tools, the tools to produce um, content or intelligent um, news reporting all over the world. The people who have internet access has completely exploded and the people who have the ability to distribute. So previously it really was not a democracy and I don't think anyone would have pretended it was in which you had a few large media organizations that controlled the means of distribution. So whatever they said would become the dominant narrative. Now what we have with the internet is everything um, is accessible and the democratization is there. And Ground Report sort of serves in a middle space, which is we don't want to be complete anarchy. We do want to add some value by applying some of these really important journalistic practices to gathering, vetting, and distributing the news. But at the same time, we want to make sure everyone has an opportunity um, to offer their views and whatever documentation they have of recent events. Um, so I think the trend is definitely going in the right direction. 
what we need now is sort of this midway filter that is able to look at that information, um, apply filters, apply vetting so that it, it comes out in, in a more intelligent, uh, sophisticated manner where it actually has value to the audience it's trying to serve. Sometimes the, the vetting process can pose entirely new um, challenges just because maybe these systems have never been applied to such local um, in breaking news events. Um, the other thing that's one of the biggest challenges is basically a learning curve to explain to um, regular people and journalists alike, especially with professional journalists, it's difficult that they can post content independently on their own. We'll vet it afterwards. They, you know, people still will be emailing articles to the site saying, is this all right? They don't, they don't really understand that they can just go ahead and publish it and we want to keep that ball rolling as quickly as possible. So it's educating people that, yes, this is okay. We want to encourage you to sort of be, be the master of your own work and be entrepreneurial and, and we'll do the rest. I think that it's more important than ever. I think that first we need to recognize that many of the people who we consider to be professional journalists may have no credentials at all, may have really earned their chops by working and, 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 ex and building work experience, um, but that we certainly need to reward entrepreneurial journalists. I think now more than ever it is very important to be a journalist who is able to innovate, who is able to be resourceful in a number of different ways by using all of these new tools and, and, and forms of, of media. Um, so I think that maybe our idea of a traditional journalist, that is less important now, but the professional journalist is more important than ever. Um, another thing that we try to do to address this on Ground Report is that we distinguish between being a professional journalist um, and being completely neutral and objective and being perhaps a, a citizen reporter, a regular layman, but being very transparent about your views. So we're focusing more on um, transparency than neutrality to say, okay, maybe you do have biases somewhere, but at least if you're expressing them on Ground Report, if you're pointing them out in your profile, it's okay if, if, there's, um, if there's a little um, disparity there. We're in the midst of our biggest information revolution, probably since the printing press, and yet we're seeing a total breakdown of how the media is going to be able to, to cover these events. I think that um, efforts that focus on hyperlocal news gathering and citizen reporting are going to be moving into this space, but I think they really need to learn from the lessons of vetting and news gathering and holding, uh, holding all reporters to high standards that we can learn from the traditional media. So I think that there's, there's a middle ground there, definitely. What I think the best thing that platforms and efforts like Ground Report have to offer is we show what can be achieved when you really cut costs, when you really remove all of the bloat and you're able to just get rid of the overhead and focus on people who are already there. So we have an incredibly lean, efficient, economical model that way that in fact is paying for itself right now and we hope to just scale that up. And I think that if we can begin to build models that start with um, taking advantage of the incredible resources of millions of people around the world with all of this power, we can start to build a model that will make sense. And I think that, that um, Ground Report's revenue share system in many ways is modeled on the way that microfinance works and that is we're rewarding people um, based on the fruits of their labor and hopefully they can invest that further and often people will or contributors will write to me and say, you know, I got this funding, I was able to get, you know, a better mobile phone or I was able to get um, a better computer and now we're going to create better reports and they're very, very passionate about it. So it's something that um, is important on so many different levels and not even just in the developing world. People are so amazed to be paid for their work, um, especially since the rule online is so often um, that sites expect you to just give your, your, the content that you're creating to them for free while they build a business model off of it. Um, well, we didn't think that was really fair. We also thought the best way to attract the people who are creating the best content online, which is a very, very small percentage of the people who are engaging online, is to reward them for, for what they're doing. I think it's certainly true that when you're looking at the digital format, we have just begun to explore its potential. I mean, we're still sort of recreating newspapers on websites, and that's, that's not really what it's built for. I think a couple of the biggest areas for innovation are, again, Twitter, which allows for the most immediate, um, fast-paced 
real-time news updates. It's a tool that I use all the time in Ground Report to stay in the loop on what the most recent breaking news is. You can often get updates there before you can get on any major news website, but also to recruit reporters who happen to be at those locations. It allows for really fast interactions and iterations there. On the flip side, there's no vetting and there's no filtering of, of that sort in terms of, of integrity, especially when you're dealing with sources you don't know on Twitter. So that's one problem. The other spaces is when you start to get into these new forms of media. Um, so we've already seen some really great innovation with photos and photography online. I think where there's some of the next steps will be with live streaming video. Ground Report TV um, launched its channel a couple of years ago, actually, on the Mogulus platform, and it allows us to basically cover live events with video using just um, an internet connection and a laptop as well as say a huge Fox uh, satellite truck that that's costs you know hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars and that's what we did this past weekend um, at the NASA shuttle launch for instance the thing that we have to wait for there is for the 3G network that's necessary for all of our mobile devices to be able to send information that quickly and it's also still a technology um, that is limited to people who have access to the internet in general. So those are those are a couple of the of the places. But when you look at things like the Nokia, you know, N95s and later models, which can allow you to stream video straight from your phone to a website, it's it's pretty incredible what the potential of that could be for a citizen-powered 24/7 uh, news channel. Well, we certainly want to serve what people are really interested in. And clearly, the, the global news category is, is much smaller than people are interested in sort of, you know, entertainment news. But that's also a very, very crowded field. I mean, there are millions of players in that field that are trying to exploit that. Um, it's something that, with the right tone, we would accept on Ground Report, but we're, we're pretty focused on making, just building up our brand. I mean, starting any kind of internet company, it's so difficult to define what you're looking for. In the beginning on Ground Report, Anything was allowed. People could post any kind of content, and after a while, it just it started to dissolve what the brand was really about. So we need to stand behind that and say, okay, we're about sophisticated global reporting from professionals or vetted by professionals or some combination of the two. What we are starting to do is to expand into specific verticals. So we might not do entertainment just yet, but we might do um, something related to gender issues, or we might start to do something related to travel. And this also has to do with some of the, the sponsors who are interested in getting involved with our work. And, and we're definitely going in those directions. Um, and we're looking to be a little bit more niche, a little bit more granular in those spaces, um, but, still, but still keep our general structure. One of the stories that is most incredible to me is that is the Taliban activity in Pakistan. Ground Report has been covering this for a year and a half. We've been getting almost daily reports of, of increased you know, militant activity in these areas. We have a very, we have a very strong um, constituent base there that's been reporting to us, lots of professional journalists. And only just now has the American media woken up to the fact that, OK, we're in the midst of a major crisis here. Um, but if, if you had looked at Ground Report a year ago, you would, have seen, you would have seen all of the indications that this was set to happen. Um, I just mentioned that I was at the NASA shuttle launch live streaming with uh, an Inmarsat satellite dish and a laptop, just enough stuff that you could fit in a knapsack. That was pretty exciting. Um, some of the other breaking stories that we've seen, um, let me try to think. In, um, in Zimbabwe, we've been seeing lots of signs of unrest. We have a lot of reporters there who are writing under pseudonyms to protect their identity. Um, but it will be anything from, you know, there's mutiny among Mugabe's soldiers, they're, they're, they want to break away, um, to general unrest among the public. Things that wouldn't end up in a newspaper in Zimbabwe because people could be in, in danger, um, but, but that we're very happy to publish and sort of counteract all the disinformation out there. We can't really take responsibility because our model is not really giving people assignments so much as allowing them to publish their own work. So in contrast to something like current TV, we don't send reporters and pay for them to go places and equip them with all these tools, although we will sometimes give people things like flip video cameras, et cetera. Um, 
we sometimes do outreach when there's been a breaking event, but it's usually nothing that requires someone to go to the scene of an event. And we're very cautious about, listen, your safety is more important to us than anything else, so never compromise that in any way. We'll usually more take the event and say, okay, what are people thinking about? How do people feel about this? How have you been affected personally? Because that's, that's what sort of takes takes the event and, and stops you from sort of glazing over, saying this is some big international issue and saying, wow, there's some emotional engagement there. That's, that's a real person who's experiencing it. Absolutely. That's, that also plays into the, the safety question because you say, oh, are you worried about people being in Pakistan? Okay, these are people who have grown up in Pakistan and they're probably the safest that anyone will ever be because they have relationships there. So again, that's exactly the kind of mobile or, or, or um, digital or even citizen reporter that we try to recruit is people who already have their own networks, who are already very connected in that region and are able to speak to people in, in decision-making capacities at the, at the head of any event that takes place or able to sort of tell us, here's exactly what you know, the, the head of the police is saying, here's what the head of the local political party is saying, and maybe they are even part of those political parties, et cetera. Um, these, these are the kind of people who will really be able to connect us in a way that a foreign, a foreign reporter never could or a foreign correspondent never could. And the other, the other side of that is they can get an answer out of these people that may be much more honest, much more revealing than, than, than a foreign reporter. Our goal for working with uh, developing countries is more to acknowledge what the situation is with their technology and, and sort of take advantage of that in, in, in the best way we can. So for instance, in a lot of these countries, the um, mobile phone penetration is enormous. So instead of pushing them to do live streaming video, which is basically impossible because they won't have an internet connection that's fast enough, we'll push them to contribute via mobile phone or, or to, to, post, to post reports that way. So we'll really focus on the mobile capacities. So when, Basically, every region in the world, there's different ways that we interact and different tools that we encourage people to use. It was inspired over a long period of time, first by um, my work as a political intern at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, which I initially wanted to work directly for the U.N., but instead got an internship with the State Department, which ultimately was probably more access than I ever could have dreamed of in, in, in any role because of the incredible um, sort of influence of the U.S. And so I was reporting daily on Security Council sessions, which are confidential, closed sessions, basically all the top ambassadors of the 10 members of the Security Council and watching firsthand as foreign policy was made and basically the biggest issues in the world were debated and decided, here's what we're going to do. The Security Council is really the, the decision-making arm of, of the UN, the only one that really carries weight and is able to carry out um, their actions. The issues at the time, um, some of the issues that I was covering was Haiti, um, the assassination of former Lebanese Prime Minister Hariri, and the Darfur crisis was really um, at its peak. It was really getting really bad. And there was one day when then um, Secretary General Kofi Annan um, came into the council and addressed the council and basically, and basically sort of begged all the members to do something. He said, it is completely out of control. And, um, and, it, and it really struck me. And the, the thing that really bothered me was the fact that um, even though the U.S. had been one of the first to call it out as genocide, the Darfur crisis, we didn't really pledge anything um, beyond saying that. We didn't pledge any concrete action, which if we had, knowing the dynamics of the Security Council, our allies probably would have responded 10 or 100 fold in supporting us. And that was something that was something that really troubled me. One of the quotes that Kofi Annan used at the time was that the role of the UN is not to bring humanity up into heaven, but to prevent it from descending into hell. And that was what was happening there. So um, I ended the internship at, at the term when it was done. And it was a fantastic experience, but I said, I need to be in a space where there's more in innovation, where things are more dynamic, because there is just so much um, bureaucracy sort of holding back that kind of innovation. And um, I went to work for LimeWire, which is a file sharing platform, which is totally different. Um, but what was interesting to me was there I was helping them relaunch their websites and learning all about these really cheap but very powerful publishing tools, and I realized we could start to address this problem that had really plagued me um, at the UN, which is that we can allow um, people to really know what's going on in the world because if the public is more informed, they can put more pressure on their governments to make responsible um, policy decisions. And I'm, I feel very strongly about that. I do believe that. 
And so the idea I had was instead of having these dry wire reports, why don't we let people who are actually there experiencing these things, these terrible atrocities or these wonderful events, um, to, in their own voice, report the news or take a photo or publish a video and we'll aggregate it all together and we'll vet it with our editors and we'll make sure um, that it's that we're giving everyone a chance to share their voice and, and reach this global audience. And that was, that was how the idea for Ground Report was born. The funny thing is that I, I had always wanted to do a job where I can, and I still do, where I can do both international relations and, and technology and web stuff. So I'm sort of like a geek on one end, but I majored in history on the other end. And five, three or four years ago, none of these jobs exist, existed. And now, of course, all these projects are exploding all over the internet. And Ground Report was just in, in its infancy when this happened. So it, it's, I basically made it up because it didn't exist. It's hard to sort of judge what the exact impact has been on public awareness because how do you measure public awareness of an idea? Um, so Ground Report has certainly brought attention to a lot of issues that people otherwise never would have heard of, but it's hard to see how that translates in, into something at the other end. We've had a lot of nonprofits, for instance, um, writing under the name of their pro nonprofit, publish reports, and later on they were eventually able to, you know, gain key legislation. Um, one interesting example is my, my hometown of Dobbs Ferry was able to get a historical uh, distinction from, from Congress um, for being one of the sites that George Washington um, visited on, on, you know, on his campaign. And they had published, the, the local historian had published numerous um, research reports and updates um, proving this. Um, so those are a couple of examples of, you know, I don't know if there's a direct uh, causation there, but certainly, certainly it contributed. Then we have other issues where we've seen um, more humanitarian-based results that are really wonderful. So, for instance, we have a we have a, an Afghani um, reporter who reported on a young woman um, about I think 16 or 17 who was attacked by her husband, who she was married to through an arranged marriage. I think he was in his 60s or 70s, and she was disfigured and she was burned with acid, and it was really terrible. And unfortunately, this is a fairly common story. But because it was on Ground Report, because it was on an English language source. The reporter was contacted by an aid organization that ended up covering all of the medical medical costs, and I didn't even hear about this until like a month after it took place. And I and I noticed because the reporter had put the follow up report on Ground Report. And so the other thing we do is we just we allow people to connect amongst themselves, and not just pushing one overall agenda, but we allow all these little connections to happen that, in little ways, help help to improve society. I think the biggest thing that I've learned, because I was coming at this not from a media or journalism background, I was coming at Ground Report from um, a diplomacy and international relations and a technology background, is the incredible importance of um, the trusted human network. So we can create these algorithms that build wonderful looking um, virtual newspapers, but without the human input, it really doesn't work because you can't get a computer to, to put stories together, at least not yet, in a way that, that really works. Um, and it's also something that translates to your community. And I mean, not just your audience, but your contributing community. So if we just, when we at Ground Report just had this algorithm that was choosing the stories and publishing, um, it, 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 it wasn't really enough. Once we built this team of volunteer Wikipedia style editors who could go in any piece of content, the, suddenly the, the platform felt like it was alive. And it really translated in the behavior of our contributors who took themselves much more seriously. They realized this is, this is an active thing and there are people on the other end who really care about what we're doing. So I would actually take sort of the opposite slant of what so many of my peers say and say it's the human network is so incredibly important that we need to really focus on, on that aspect and also a lot, of, uh, a lot of the things that go along with that like vetting and, and, and fact checking. Mm -hmm.